Kagor! Repeat after me. I, Takami Kago. I, Takami Kago. Am a burden to my entire family. Am a burden to my entire family. And there is absolutely nothing I can do right. And there is absolutely nothing I can do right. He had relived that same nightmare over and over again for the past three days. There was just something about being in a building high up away from everyone else with a big plate of food and someone who... Endeavor. That made Takami keep talking. Takami eventually opened up and explained to him what's been going on the past few days. The repeating dreams that forced him to stay up in fear of experiencing them again. The weird glowing light that seemed to follow him throughout the dream. And you. You haven't talked to them since you told them I couldn't care about them? No. Are you going to? I wouldn't know what to say. Even after he showed you time and time again how there was absolutely nothing he could do right, you still were willing to give him a shot. All he needed to do was say yes, and yet he can't. There's this camera guy that they get along pretty well with. Fukuro's large brown eyes drinking in yours. Kuro. Kuro? Kuro hasn't been himself lately. Your hands are shaking. Yeah, my blood sugar's been pretty out of whack lately. You eyed him for a moment. He looked worn out. It was like he was functioning for two people. You really hoped he didn't burn out. Two days before the annual hero billboard chart JP. There is an old lady in Takami's apartment in the middle of the night. Something told him that this lady knew something about what's been going on in his dreams. I have reason to believe that my grandson has been toying with your head. Your grandson. Fukuro Shima? Kuro. Shima doesn't have a quirk. Kuro doesn't have a registered quirk. But I can assure you he has one. I'm assuming you've heard the voices, right? He called them... Hone, the skeletons in his mind. The government has quite a bit of information on my son. Kon Shima. They call his quirk third eye due to the literal third eye he has on his forehead. He's able to transmit negative thoughts and emotions to other people. About 15 years ago, he, in a fit of rage, strangled his wife, killing her in their home in front of their son. The voices in Kon weren't bad voices. They weren't bad voices because Ton and Kon weren't bad people. The voices only became bad when Kon began to ask, can we go outside? We enrolled him in school. Children are incredibly fragile and impressionable. The Hone are not the ones responsible for cultivating the negative thoughts that plagued my husband and son's minds. It was other people who did that. Kon met a woman after he finished high school. Her name was Shinari. We got word that they were having a baby. They seemed happy. Until about eight years later. The social workers told us Shinari died on Kudo's first day of third grade. The government and law enforcement kept the story under wraps, so most people figured any rumors about it were lies or exaggerations. Even I don't know exactly what happened, but I do know that Kudo arrived at our doorstep with the scar on his forehead in the exact spot Kon's eye was. The beanies. The way Shima's hair always covered his face. Kudo talked to the Hone, too, and when we saw that he'd made a friend in high school, we thought he might be okay. Takami knew what it was like to grow up alone, and through people like Endeavor, people like you, he knew just how much having a relationship means to someone who was isolated. Takami hurt you, and it was only a matter of time before the Hone got word back to Shima. The Hone are alive between his grandfather passing, the stress of his job, and whatever is going on between you three. The Hone are going into overdrive to protect Kuro. I think his quirk is mutating, and I don't think it's safe for him to be at this event.
Seven missed calls from Chicken Nugget. Three new voicemails from Chicken Nugget. Five new messages. Chicken Nugget. Hey, look, I know I'm the last person you want to talk to right now. Or ever. But this is really important. Can you please pick up? It's about Shima. Please. Please, just tell me you're okay. Places in 30! Thank you, 30! Sorry, can you look up? It's really hard for me to line your eyes if you're staring in your lap like that. Oh, right. Sorry. You peeled your eyes away from the blue light in your lap and instead looked at yourself partially made up in the mirror. Accents of green twinkled on your face. Once complete, the wings of the liner were so sharp, they could be peeled off and thrown as kunai. The makeup artist was done with you, and with how much time you spent in the chair staring at your phone, the makeup artist was done with you. Hawks had been calling you since yesterday, and when you wouldn't pick up any of his calls, he started texting rattling on about Kuro and how he hoped you were okay. What was he playing at? And why were you so anxious about it all of a sudden? I... A soft puff of brown materialized in the mirror. Kuro. I... You breathed out. You look amazing, was all he said as he stepped into the dressing room, trading places with the makeup artist. You looked down at your attire. A half-black, half-white suit. The only pop of color coming from the green socks that went quite well with your black combats. Thanks, you quipped, sliding out of your seat and turning to look at him in person. How are you feeling? I'm fine. Don't worry about me. You took in the lanky boy. He did look fine. More rested than before, and in a tan corduroy getup and purple beanie that complemented his hair and eyes nicely. What about you? He asked. Honest answer? You bit your lip. I want to vomit. And my legs are doing the jelly thing again, which I think is why Sintaihi made these pants so big. Kudo's shoulders shook as he let out another one of his giggles that you swore should be illegal. <laughs> well, Mr. MC Hammer, I just came to do a quick camera test if you don't mind. Yeah, no, sure, lead the way. You followed Kudo down the hall weaving past bustling crew members carrying pieces of heavy lights and equipment. It took you a second to realize that Kuro had grabbed your hand to help you maneuver the crowd. Kuro? Huh? He turned back to look at you as he walked. Why didn't you grab one of the interns to run the test? Uh. He paused for a second taking care to make sure you didn't run into him. Because the consistent focal point of this whole program is you. So it would only make sense to double-check the settings using you as the centerpiece. This is your show, remember? Right. Your show. The two of you were about to keep walking when an unmistakable flash of red appeared from one of the dressing rooms. The door narrowly missed your face. Kudo tugged you out of harm's way. Uh, hey, Hawk said. Hi, you replied. The last time you saw him, he was sticky and covered in artificial strawberry. Did you read my- No. You were quick to lie. And what hurt Hawks more? 
is that he knew you were lying. Look, can we please talk? It's really important. So is this camera test, Kudo cut in. Everyone else in the hallway seemed to disappear as Hawks and Kudo met each other's gaze. There was an unmistakable energy that silently told anyone even thinking about walking in their general direction to find another path immediately. You weren't expecting Kudo to speak up like that, and definitely not in the tone he used on Hawks, but... and you couldn't figure out why. When you heard his voice... It kind of made you think Kudo had a point. What gave Hawks the right to ask to speak to you 15 minutes before cameras went live? No, seriously, who does he think he is? One moment Hawks is telling you he doesn't care about you and the next he's texting you about a person he barely even knows and asking about your well-being. Talking to him wasn't important. What was important was making sure everything was set in place for this program. The thing is, you couldn't even be surprised. And why should you be? Hawks made it crystal clear that the only person he cared about was himself. You sure seem pressed to do something that isn't even your job, Hawks pressed his voice low as he spoke. Oh, really? Running a camera test wouldn't be the job of the head of cinematography? Hawk's eyes widened, as did yours. Though you shouldn't be shocked. It all made sense now. Sun Taihi dragging him off before the online interview, Kudo's exhaustion and his phone constantly ringing, you knew Sin Tai He was fond of Kudo's videography skills, but you had no idea he'd gone from being in charge of camera number two to being in charge of every camera and every person running said camera in the building. A beat passed before Kudo finally broke the silence. You should really be more careful when opening doors, Takami. Kudo stated, smoothly placing a hand on the winged hero's shoulder. Of course. Wouldn't want to hurt anyone, would I, Shima? Since when were he and Hawks close enough to refer to each other by name? And maybe it was your eyes playing tricks on you in the dim lighting backstage, but you could have swore you saw Takami wince under Kudo's grasp. Before you could think too much about it, Kudo had let go of him and was leading you further down the hall towards the stage. But not before turning and muttering, well, it wouldn't be the first time. As you rounded the corner, you caught a glimpse of the one and only Endeavor leaning down and whispering something in Hawk's ear. Places, people! Two minutes until camera roll! Remember, this is live, so if you die, you better make sure you die in the most entertaining way possible! Do I make myself clear? A chorus of yes, 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 yes. rang out from the crew. You tried to keep your focus backstage, and not on the mass amount of people you could hear from behind the curtain. You gulped as the small triple, uh, quadruple threat made her way towards you. Are your legs shaking? Sun asked. No, ma'am. Are you lying? Yes, ma'am. Sun reached out and held your quivering legs in her hands. The silent intimidation radiating from her fingertips alone was enough to scare your appendages into submission and ease the jelly-like syndrome. You're going to do fine. You're trained by the best agent in the whole entire universe. This project is being produced by God herself. You failing is absolutely impossible. You were oddly frightened and soothed by Sun Taihi's words at the same time. 
Thank you, ma'am. You stuttered out. Oh, any time, mediocre model. The son smiled warmly. Before bellowing. All right, let's go, you cowards! We go live and five... Five, five, five... Four... four, four, four three, 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 three... Two... two, 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 two. There was something about a live audience... You couldn't quite put your finger on it. Maybe it was the way the crowd roared as you stepped on stage. Its sound deafening enough to shake the floorboard, sending vibrations up from your boots. Or maybe it was the sheer knowledge that this was the largest crowd you've ever been in front of in your entire career. In your entire life. And there was absolutely no room for error. You weren't sure what it was. But there was something about being in front of a live audience of this capacity that gave you so much... Power. Instead of thinking everyone is judging you, imagine they're giving you the strength you need to keep going. You're the MC for crying out loud. If anything, this is your show. And everyone else is just in the background. You weren't shaking. You were vibrating. You could feel it in your core. Every cell in your body moving so much, it was creating heat. Kudo was right. This is your show. And you were going to make damn sure your audience knew that. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, all my non-binary and fluid friends, good evening! You threw your hands in the air and commanded the crowd blow up, growing even louder for you. As you can only imagine, I am... So excited to be here tonight as we count down Japan's top 10 pro heroes! Now, backstage are 10 of Japan's pro heroes who you, yes you, voted to be the most powerful, most service-oriented, most attractive, and most popular heroes in the entire country, but they will not come out until you make some Nice! You were on a roll, fluidly running through each talking point as drilled by Sintai He, and carrying your audience on a wild roller coaster ride, urging them to match your energy the entire time. There was not one person in that studio who didn't have their eyes glued on you. And that included Hawks. Takami should be used to billboard events by now. He'd been on this stage more times than he'd eaten salads. However, he'd never stepped out on stage to see you. He didn't know what Shima told the lighting director to do in whatever camera test he was going on about. But whatever it was, gave you an ethereal glow on the giant monitors around the studio above the live crowd and broadcasting to people's homes. Still, there was something about seeing you on stage like that, speaking so fluidly that made Takami a bit uneasy. He couldn't help but wonder if this was just another installment of his reoccurring dreams. Which, of course, he now knew as a result of Fukuro, the head cinematographer of Shima. Still, one glance at Endeavor kept Takami grounded. You didn't realize the event was over until you heard yourself saying goodbye to the audience both live and on television and thanking them for their time and attention. 
Fade to black, fade to black, fade to black, and... Yes! That's a wrap! Alright, thank you! I need the events team clearing out the building. I need all crew members to get all your crap out of my studio immediately! Let's go! As the curtains closed, and the cameras stopped rolling, you finally began to feel your adrenaline catch up with you, and your legs began to shake again. You thought about the latter half of the program, running through the top five heroes, which of course included Hawks. He played his part perfectly, spreading his wings wide and floating effortlessly, smiling for the camera. His smile was smug as usual, but in a way that put someone at ease. A silent way of saying, don't worry, I'll take care of this. A promise to do whatever he can, hold the entire world up by his wings if he had to, to ensure a future where heroes are no longer needed for peace. Still, as your eyes briefly met on stage, you couldn't help but think about how in his pursuit to hold the world up, he had let you down. You were... No, scratch that. Are amazing. Kudo was the first person to greet you when you were off stage, pulling you into a tight embrace, causing your face to flush. You weren't sure what it was about him, but his confidence levels were through the roof today. You didn't mind, though it did catch you off guard quite a few times. After a performance like that, you gotta let me take you out for coffee. Kudo, I'd love to, but I'm honestly pretty tired. Just a pastry then, Kudo countered. You thought for a moment, before agreeing. You worked hard. You deserve to treat yourself to a late night pastry. At least, that was what you thought, until the two of you were stopped near the back exit by two men in suits. Fukuro Shima. One of the men, with chunky blue locks, who matched Kudo in height, but was muscular enough to snap the entire studio in two if given the chance, stated, Please come with me quietly. What's this all about? Your brows furrowed. You moved to step between Kudo and the man when the other man, this one much smaller in comparison, placed a hand up to stop you. Your eyes snapped towards his dangerously when you felt a tug on your collar. It's okay, Kudo said. I've got this. I'll go. Do you even know who these people are? Or what they want? Kudo placed both of your hands in his held them up, and smiled. I have a feeling I know who sent them. We'll be okay. It's fine. Go ahead. I'll meet up later, and then we'll get out of here. And with that, he was escorted out. You quickly tried to open the door to follow them, but the knob wouldn't budge. Cursing under your breath, you whirled around just in time to catch a certain winged hero already out of costume, slipping off and muttering into his headset. Your eyes narrowed as you began to piece things together. This is really important. Can you please pick up? It's about Shima. I have a feeling I know who sent them. You quickly trailed behind him. Hey! You hissed. Hey, hey! You were finally close enough to grab Hawk's shoulder, forcing him to turn around and face you. I don't know what the hell it is you're up to, but you need to quit it. Now! A wave of shock flickered over Hawk's eyes before he recovered. We can't talk here. No. You shot back. You don't get to tell me where we can and cannot talk. I'm serious, we can't. 
Your argument was cut off by the sound of screams coming from outside the studio. Shit, was all he said before taking off towards the door, yelling over his shoulder. Stay here. Hell no, you called back, sprinting after him. Whatever was going on, you were positive it had something to do with Kuro, and you'd be damned if he got hurt because of whatever Hawks was planning. However, you weren't expecting the sight before you when you made it out of the studio and onto the busy intersection ahead. The man with locks held two women suspended at least 20 feet in the air by his hair, which stretched in length and seemed to slither about. You'd seen hair like that before. Not exactly, but similar. When you were just starting out in your career, you worked as an extra on a commercial starring someone with curly blonde hair she secured in an updo with a clip. It was your first time working with the pro hero, though she definitely seemed to prioritize her modeling work. What was her name again? Wabami! Giant Snake. Whatever was happening clearly was not a part of the plan, because a smaller suit man was yelling for him to stop. Jafar, what are you doing? Put them down! They were looking at me the wrong way! All you people are the same. I can't walk down the street without someone being afraid of me! You could hear the hissing from where you stood. They weren't afraid of you, man, but they're definitely afraid of how high they are! You gotta put them down! Oh yeah? Jafar only seemed to grow more in rage. Why don't you make me? Jafar, you know I can't- Heavy. Do it. The voice didn't come from the intersection. The voice was right in front of you. In all the commotion, Hawks hadn't moved. He instead remained close to the door, away from the crowd, and spoke through his earpiece. Why wasn't he doing anything? You thought. He had wings. He could easily fly up and save those two. You heard the staticky voice come over the headset. But the civilians... Drop them. Your head snapped towards Hawks, who didn't bat an eye. Then back towards the intersection, where small suit guy, Heavy, took off running towards Jafar, who did nothing to stop him. If anything, he even seemed to smile a bit as Heavy placed his hands on Jafar's shoulders. The snakes that held the wailing woman captive let out strained noises as they began to struggle to keep them up. The growing crowd panicked as they quickly dropped towards the pavement, taking the screaming woman with them. Their distress was cut short by two red feathers swooping in to cushion their fall. You blinked and almost missed the winged hero disappear into the crowd. Almost. You didn't care how fast he was. He clearly had connections with the suited men who took Kuro, and you weren't about to let him go that easily. You were done with his disappearing axe. So, like a child, you grabbed onto the hem of his simple black jacket and held on tight as he wove through the crowd, muttering into his earpiece. Grab a few rookies, someone less significant. That red kid, number 10. Not his friend, he'll draw too much attention. Actually, yes, do grab his friend. Get them on crowd control and civilian aid. Check on those two women and see to it that they're okay. Hawk's civilian attire, his swift movement, and his height, if you were being honest, made it easy for him to weave out of the crowd and away from the commotion. But you couldn't figure out why. You've watched more online videos of Hawks taking down villains than you'd like to admit. Enough to know that this was not his style. Hawks could have taken down a petty criminal like that in seconds, and got those women to a medic, and taken care of the crowd to get traffic running in the intersection again. Yet, for the most part, he stayed to the side, risking the safety of civilians in favor of keeping a low profile. Seriously, what was with him? 
you were pretty sure Hawks didn't have a low-profile feather on his body unless... The two of you rounded a corner well out of sight, nearly ramming into the large frame of Jafar. You stumbled back, whipping your head back towards the intersection, expecting someone from the authorities to come looking for him. However, no one came. His skin was jaundice and damp with sweat. Even the snakes were shaken up. I'm sorry. I I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. Where is he? Hawks cut off the rambling man. Uh, I, I don't know. He took off after he got into my head. I think he was headed towards the building across from the studio. A syndrome department store or something like that. The one with the huge jumbotron showing soda ads. You weren't kidding about that Shima kid. Is anybody gonna tell me what is going on here? Your voice was calm. So calm, even you were surprised. You could see the muscles in Hawk's back tense, even through his jacket. Like he just remembered you'd been trailing him this whole time. I told you to stay back at the studio. I don't have enough time and you're not safe. I'm not safe? I just watched Kudo get kidnapped by whoever you people are! You gestured towards Jafar. And then, I head out of the studio to see you waving around civilians like kites and you! You pointed towards Hawks. Creeping around corners, and I find out that you're in on it too! There it was. There was the anger you were expecting to hear when you first started speaking. Is this some sort of publicity stunt? I know you two had that standoff before the show. But do you really hate Kudo that much that you're willing to terrify him like this? Shima is dangerous, Hawks tried to reason. Shima is a cameraman! He can't take two steps without tripping over himself. He doesn't even have a quirk! He does. Your eyes darted towards Jafar who spoke so earnestly, you couldn't help but falter. He's got... voices. They creep in your head and they grab stuff. All the bad stuff. It's like, the longer they're there, the deeper they go, and the more stuff they can pull out to the surface, and they... He paused to calm down the snakes, pulling them into a ponytail. They knew how I got about people looking at me. About people avoiding me because they're afraid of my snakes. I... I... Those voices got into my head. And they kept talking. And telling me how much people were afraid of me. And if they feared me so much, I should give them something to fear. And so I... I... I'm sorry. Jafar's voice cracked as he spoke. It's called the Hone, Hawk said. I spoke with Mayu. She came to see me and told me all about it. Your heart sank when you heard the name of Kudo's grandmother, and you began to realize that they were telling the truth. Hawks explained everything to you. The Hone and how it worked. The truth about Kudo's father. The dreams Hawks had been experiencing. You hated to admit it, but... It made sense. Why he was so defensive when you reached for his beanie. Why he's been so tired these past few days. Kudo wasn't tired from show preparation. The voices. These... Hone were draining him. And Hawks wasn't trying to kidnap Kuro as some kind of weird plan to keep him from grabbing coffee with you. He was trying to save him before the voices consumed him. You were snapped out of your thoughts by the sound of static from Hawks' headset. We got a heat signature on the kid. Was that... Was that Endeavor? The number one hero was in on this? He's inside the department store. He's climbing the levels and fast. Looks 
Looks like he's headed towards the roof. Got it. Hawks turned towards you. One look, and he knew you weren't going to let him go in without you. He let out a puff of air before reaching out a gloved hand. You stared at it for a moment, before intertwining your fingers with his and letting him lead the way. Hawk stayed on the ground, knowing that flying would draw too much attention. The two of you took off around the block rather than crossing the busy intersection. Still, between the incident that just happened a block away and Hawk's iconic wings zipping through the street, you were able to attract the attention of a small crowd of people who began to trail behind. You felt your limbs sway with each murmur that grew into an outright outburst as the two of you outran the crowd. Hey, Hawks! Late night rendezvous! All right! Who's that with them? Are you recording the host from the building? Of course I'm recording this. Where are they going? Quick, take a picture! My phone's dead! Hawks took a sharp left into a narrow alleyway, pulling you with him. You opened your mouth to yelp, but felt a gloved hand cover your mouth, while the other pulled you flush against his chest. He breathed. Let them pass. Hawks kept his back against the wall and stayed with you as the mob ran by, overlooking the small nook you two were tucked in. He relaxed and turned towards the door the back entrance of the department store, and used one of his feathers to pick the lock and enter the building. <laughs> You'd been inside Syndrome many times before. It sold retro Harajuku-style clothes that were cheap enough to fit your budget but trendy enough that Sintai He wouldn't yell at you for being a complete embarrassment to my reputation, as she so nicely put it. The interior was always bright, with pastel-colored mannequins and whimsical space-themed decor. However, it didn't feel that way when you entered the building. Mall music echoed through the closed store, blasting distorted versions of nostalgic tunes and the occasional advertisement from affiliated establishments. You tried to ignore your jelly legs and keep a steady pace as a commercial broke into a ramble about a 12-piece for 9.99 yen tonight only if you ordered delivery via Foodie Eats. You hadn't been back since your last visit with Hawks. And with everything happening in the moment, that place was the last thing you wanted to think about. Leave it to fast food to do what it does best and make your stomach churn. Stay close, Hawks mumbled. You nodded, grabbing on to the hem of his jacket once again. However, your efforts to maintain close proximity served futile when Hawks opened the door towards the stairwell, and it slammed before you could enter. You jumped back but immediately ran to bang on the door. Hawks? Hey! Hawks! Open that door and he'll kill you. Open that door and he'll kill you. Put that excuse of a being no right to be a pro hero. It's dangerous. No, 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 I'll keep you safe.
You flinched. The voice echoed from behind the door. In all your banging, you nearly missed it. It was familiar. A voice you didn't know, but knew. Like... It could let itself in and make itself at home in your headspace, and you wouldn't mind. Because it was always meant to be there. Right? You shook your head and continued to fight with the door, shaking and pounding until finally, in a fit of frustration, you lifted your leg and kicked the door in leaving a foot-shaped dent in the heavy iron. The metal was hot to the touch as you shoved it out of the way like a cheap screen door. Something was in the air. There had to be. Because it seemed the higher you climbed, the more lightheaded you became. By the time you reached the top floor, you were so disoriented that if you didn't know any better, you would have thought someone carried you up the stairs. And when you reached for the door handle, you'd completely forgotten what you were doing in the building in the first place. On your left! You dove to the ground, seconds away from being decapitated by a spare piece of plywood carelessly swung by a crewmate. What are you doing all sprawled out on the floor? We're losing light here! You glanced up from your fall to see the shiny retro restaurant. Its floors freshly cleaned and counters waxed. The twinkling tree tucked away at just the right angle to let the audience know what time of year it was. Oh. Right. You remembered what you were doing here. The Quicken Chicken Christmas Campaign. You've been working for nearly a year now. And you were sure you were used to the typical stage crew. This is the most important set piece you will ever cross paths with in your entire life! So when I say move, you best get out the way! Energy. However, you'd never seen anyone on set freak out as much as the crew was for this shoot in particular. You'd been on set for two hours, all done up in hair and makeup, and you still had no idea who you were running lines with. The name had been redacted from the script, leaving you to imagine your scene partner murmuring sales pitches to yourself in the mirror. Modeling was one thing. It was easy to hide behind a carefully rehearsed face. But to actually open your mouth and convince the camera that you had a... Uh... How do you pronounce this word? I self esteem that was a lot harder, especially when you were tripping over every other line. But your agent told you acting was a surefire way to gain traction in your career. And it paid more, and rent was coming up, so... Oh, yeah. I can definitely see why you messed that one up. I'd say those lines are cheesier than the mac and cheese, but we all know that's Velveeta, so there's no point in all that. You nearly shot out of your chair when you saw the voice's owner in the mirror. You've heard of celebrity walk-ons on shows and photo shoots, but never would you have expected the number three pro hero of all people to be on the set of this D-list commercial dressed in a retro diner outfit behind you, talking to you. Before you could respond, he plucked the script from your hands and read over it, nodding at some parts and shaking his head at others, 
grabbing the charcoal eyeliner from the vanity and using it to cross out parts of the script as he saw fit. I'm Hawks, by the way, he said, flashing a look that said, I know you know my name, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. He didn't give you time to introduce yourself before he spoke again. I couldn't help but notice you are horrible at running lines and would like to offer my assistance. He winked at you in the mirror. Uh, are, are, are you my partner? It took everything you had in you to fumble out those words. You couldn't even look at him directly, opting to keep vague eye contact through the mirror, staring more at his wings than anything else. Whoa, hold your horses, cowboy. We only just met. You turned to face him now, confused by what he was on about. It wasn't until your eyes met and you saw his mischievous smirk that you felt your face flush and you began to scramble for damage control. No, no, wait! That's not what I... Seen, partner! I meant seen, partner! Potato, potato. Hawk shrugged, grabbing the now marked up script from the vanity and making his way towards the middle of the set the normally pissy crew members now falling over themselves to get out of his way, parting like the Red Sea. Well? He asked, propping himself on the countertop and leaning on the fake cash register plastered with deals like, Buy one side of green beans and get one half off! You gonna go over these with me or not, partner? You couldn't help but feel deja vu as you made your way towards him. Why would you need to run these lines? You've ran them countless times before. Not only that, the script was dated. The whole set, too. They discontinued the green beans over a year ago when they realized no one in their right mind goes to a Korean fried chicken joint to get green beans. Don't go. You're just a plaything to him. He'll leave you as soon as he's bored. What? That was ridiculous. He was just running lines with you. You barely knew him. It wasn't that serious. Why did you... find yourself... wanting it to be serious? It was an offer to be by Hawk's side. So, you took it. Until you saw him glancing at his phone, frowning. Ugh, duty calls. Wait, what? Why do you feel like you've heard this before? And why did it cause your stomach to churn in such a manner? The actions that followed played out like a well-rehearsed dance that you've watched on loop time and time again. Hawk slipped off his apron and slipped on his flight jacket. He tucked his phone in his pocket, careful not to let you see the screen, and made his way towards the exit. Until you stepped in, interrupting the choreography. Don't. Your hand was on his before you even realized what you were doing. Not here, you whispered. This place was sacred. This time was sacred. Before the two of you got too close and you were forced to figure out what you were, only to confuse things even more. And this place... You could be vulnerable with him. You could stumble over your lines and say stupid stuff like call him partner and he can respond in the worst cowboy accent known to man and it was okay. Because here, Hawks didn't have any sudden obligations to run off to. He was there. He was yours and he'd let you be vulnerable with him. You were hoping that maybe, just maybe, this time, 
He'd stay long enough to be vulnerable with you. What are you doing? Let him go! He's dangerous! He's going to hurt you! The voice was closer now, practically whispering in your ear. He already has. You felt the room shift around you. A crisp breeze hit you. You were no longer on the set of a restaurant, but the roof of a skyscraper. You weren't holding Hawk's hand. You were holding Kudos. Or, more specifically, Kudo was holding your hand while you reached out for an unconscious Hawks who was being restrained by Heavy. So, this was the power of Kudo's quirk. The color Kudo had managed to accumulate on his face earlier had drained, leaving him looking worse than he did in the coffee shop the other day. Bulging veins peaked from beneath his beanie. Kudo, what have you done? How many people do you have under your influence right now? I didn't do anything, he said. I'm just trying to keep you safe. Hawks wants to protect Japan. He wants to create a world where we don't need heroes, but in reality, he doesn't need you. You have to believe me. I saw it for myself. No. You muttered. No, that's not true. So, you... You, you think I'm lying? The boy stammered. I don't think you're lying, Kudo. You tried to keep your voice steady, and turned to use your other hand to cup his and yours. I think you're very overwhelmed now. I'm not overwhelmed. I've been in his dreams. I know what he's capable of. I saw him! Kudo's bloodshot eyes trembled as they searched yours. Your brows furrowed as you took Kudo's pleas in, processing the information. There was a long pause. In your peripheral, you could see over the edge of the building. The small crowd from earlier had grown exponentially. Word must have gotten around from when you were spotted earlier. And you could have sworn you heard the sound of helicopters whirring overhead. You felt your limbs begin to tremor. You still don't believe me, he mumbled. Kudo. And you're not going to believe me until I show you. Kudo slipped his hands out of yours. He took a few steps back before turning to Heavy. Let him go, he said. Heavy stepped away from Hawks, allowing him to stumble forward. Fine, Kudo said, slipping off his beanie. In the center of Kudo's temple was a bulging wound with a horizontal crease in the middle. It twitched and pulsated until finally the flesh ripped open, spewing blood across the cement. The liquid dripped down his forehead and dribbled to his chin as a third eye emerged on the surface, pupil red in color and extremely dilated as it darted around widely. The crease closed and opened itself once more, blinking. Let me show you firsthand just how dangerous hawks can be. 
Your eyes flickered to Hawk's amber pupils as he shook and stirred awake. His eyes were clouded and dull. Hawks, what ha- <laughs> Before you could finish, the winged hero charged at you, grabbing you by the neck and lifting you up until the toes of your shoes only grazed the ground. You let out a cough as you struggled against his hold, scratching your arms with your nails, swinging your legs hard enough to make him stumble but not release his grip. It was futile. He threw you to the ground. You winced at the slight crack sound that echoed in your ears as your body made contact with the cement. As you sat up, you felt reality constrict and fold in on itself. Darkness. You aren't supposed to be here, the voice crawled out. Out of the shadows stepped Hawks. He was a child, no older than ten. He looked up at you, fiddling with an Endeavor action figure in his hands. He bit his lips before sighing reluctantly. Hmm... I guess I can kick Agent Mole out. He won't be happy about it, though, he muttered, returning back into the shadows. He stopped and looked at you expectantly. Timidly, you followed. Deeper into the shadows, you saw what he was talking about. You weren't supposed to be here. On the floor sat a quickened chicken bucket surrounded by a scarce amount of action figures, about six or so. The cheap kind. The kind you got from kids' meals. Pieces of chicken were broken up onto little pieces and spread onto individual napkins, one for each toy. Don't worry. Mole's comic isn't that popular. No one wants to read about a mole, anyway. And he can't see, so he won't know if I move him for just today. Hawks plucked the mole action figure from the circle and gestured for you to sit down in its place. Dazed, you took a seat on the floor as the child followed suit. What are we... doing here? You asked. Having family dinner, Hawks responded simply, reaching into the bucket and grabbing a wing. If you want to eat, you got to grab it for yourself. If you're not fast, the food will be gone. But leave some for Dad. He doesn't eat till late. you got to put the bucket in the fridge, though. He doesn't like it when we have family dinner. Why? You ask. It's a waste. Hawks answered. We're not a family. Or, at least... I'm not. I'm a burden. And there is absolutely nothing I can do right. You open your mouth to tell him that's not true. But before you could speak, you felt a sharp blow to your stomach. And your body went flying across the roof, skidding towards the edge. Hawks had drawn his feathers now, and he clearly wasn't taking any prisoners. Still, for some reason, your body was able to recover from his blows. You could hear the crowd's distress below. With shaky arms and legs, you propped yourself up on all fours just in time to watch the hero charge towards you a second time at neck-breaking speeds. When it comes to you, you're nothing. Nothing, 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 nothing! Back into the void. You felt a shiver run down your spine. Icy fingers gripped your flesh, 
holding you in place. You have no right to call yourself a hero, Takami Keigo. You squinted into the shadows. You don't have to do this. Lights up. The spotlight glared down in front of you, revealing the same interview setup you and Hawk shared last week. Except, this time, it was Kudo and Hawk's in the plush sofas while you remained paralyzed in the producer's chair, watching the scene play out through the lens of Kudo's old camera. Kudo rested his elbows on the armrest and his hands on his lap as his eyes, all three of them, took in the man across from him. Yes, I do. These are the precautions I have to take to keep you safe. Kudo turned and looked directly at you upon finishing his statement, before facing Hawks once more. You better than anyone should know that. Hawks pursed his lips lightly. I know your type, Takemi, Kudo continued. Number two hero, everyone thinks they're safe with you. Everyone wants to be saved by you, and why wouldn't they? You're so charming, so fast, so efficient. The imaginary fingers strengthened their hold, reaching in your mouth and grabbing your tongue. Shima. Hawk's eyes darted to you before returning to Kudo. This isn't going to help you. His voice came out slow and calculated. Kudo scoffed, leaning forward now, clasping his hands together. <laughs> help me? Unlike you, I'm not just trying to help myself. You're willing to go through incredible lengths to keep humanity safe just so you can look good, so you can steal the spotlight. The spotlight snapped its glare on Hawks. Despite its bright rays, the temperature radiating from it was so cold. Even from where you sat, you began to lose feeling in your arms and legs. But when it comes to those who matter most, you toss them to the side like garbage because you are so incompetent that you can't, you won't care for them even when they're sitting there practically begging you to. Kudo turned to face you once more. You tried to open your mouth, but you couldn't. You could have sworn your lips had turned blue by now. Takami runs off to save everyone else. But when it comes to you, you're nothing. You need to see just how far he's willing to go to protect everyone who is not you. Lights out. Deeper into the void. Lights up. Spotlight on. Cameras rolling. All eyes. All eyes. All eyes on... Two bodies hung from the rafters of the studio, suspended by their wrist with lighting cables. Drip. 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 Blood. Sticky, cold, and blue fell from the lacerations scattered along their flesh and onto the woolly green rug laid out on the floor between the sofas and you. All at once, the icy fingers released their hold on you, allowing space for a scream to exit your body. But nothing more than a hoarse whisper came out. The blue blood had stopped dripping, and in its place, small feathers began to drift from the ceiling like red snow, falling to the ground in silence. 
It was as if the entire world had been placed on mute. Hawk's eyes met yours briefly, before flickering towards the floor. He opened his mouth, before letting out of breath and closing it. There were no lines, no heavily rehearsed words about how he was only doing what he had to, and if only you were there, and if only you knew what was at stake, and the things that were going through his head, the things that are going through his head. Please, please don't go through his head. Ox could allow none of it to fall out of his mouth to try and distract you. Everything was out on the table, and there was nothing he could do about it. He felt so helpless. You see it now, don't you? Kudo stood from the sofa and made his way towards you. Yet, as he walked, all you could do was stare at the puddle of blue and the way each feather that floated on the slime became soggy as his shoes dug into the carpet, drowning them with each step. How long had they been hanging there? How long has Hawks been keeping this to himself? Hawks had been to places he couldn't tell you about. He told you that. Less than an hour ago, he looked the entire world in the face and said he would carry the weight of it on his shoulders if he had to. Before? You thought he was leaving you behind because you were nothing but a toy to him. Now, you are beginning to understand why Hawks wouldn't let you close. Let you see too much. Because... If you saw the things that made him vulnerable, you might also see the things he believed made him nothing more than a monster. Kudo. Stop. Kudo faltered, halting mid-step and looking at you. You allowed your eyes to raise from the floor and rest on your friend. The blood on his face now a deep mahogany. Scabbed and cakey, his eyes baggy and inflamed, and the fluffy curls you loved so much, now matted, damp with blood and sweat, hanging limp on his scalp. But you were supposed to, he began. You shook your head. I'm sorry. I can't do that. Kudo, he's right. This isn't going to help you. I already told you, Kudo whispered, eyes softening. All of this is for you, not me. Kudo, if you put all your time and attention on me, your well-being is going to suffer. Hawks told me- What? Kudo snapped turning sharply to face the man in question, squelching across the carpet and yanking him up by his neck, out of his chair, until his feet hovered off the floor. Ox told you what? He seethed. Hawk's <coughs> voice came out raspy, the words clawing up his throat in a desperate struggle to escape. Only low wheezes could come out. Kudo's eyes searched his. Hawks didn't even have a chance to block his advances before Kudo reached into his head and snatched out the information. He went through my family files and spoke with my grandmother, he muttered, throwing Hawks onto the floor. Hawks struggled to stand, wobbly on all fours, wheezing. Kudo scoffed. <sighs> Your father was right. You really shouldn't have been born. Hawk's labored breaths slowly steadied. And finally, in a hoarse voice, 
He spoke. You're... right, Shima. Kudo cocked a brow, a little taken aback by his statement. You do know my type. You know it, because you've seen it firsthand. You know, because we're more alike than you'd like to think. As Hogg spoke, the space began to shift again, deeper into the void. This time, into a house you couldn't recognize. You were in a kitchen. The morning sun shone through the window. The bright flowers that bloomed from the garden in the backyard told you it was spring, even though the air remained chilled. The smell of coffee and grilled fish filled your nostrils. What did you just do? Kudo said. There was a slight tremor in his voice. I didn't do anything. Hawks was on his feet now. Kudo? Is that you? A melodic voice rang out. A woman entered the kitchen in a yellow dress so long and flowy, she practically glided across the hardwood floor. Petite, tanned hands skillfully removed the mackerel from the stove and placed it on a plate, along with rice and steamed cabbage and fried plantains. She blew her own fluffy brown curls out of her face before placing her hands on her hips and calling once again. Kudo! I don't hear any footsteps. Another minute more and you'll be late for school. A small boy bounded his way down the hall into the kitchen. You'd recognize that big hair and those equally large eyes anywhere. Kusan. Kudo. Older Kudo, muttered. The two didn't seem to pay him any mind. Or any of you, for that matter. I have a surprise for you! The boy chirped. Is that so? Well, let's see it then. No! The boy shook his head, curls flying everywhere. It's a secret! We have to wait until Daddy gets home! Oh? Kudo's mother allowed a mischievous smile to play on her lips. All right then. We might have to wait until after school. You know Kasan doesn't get home until... The woman was cut off by the sound of a creaking door from down the hall. The boy gasped. Daddy's home! You've heard about Kudo's father. The many rumors your classmates spread about him that you refused to listen to. You heard he was ruthless. A monster. And that his son would turn out exactly like him. Out of all the pictures you had in your head of the bits and pieces of gossip that did trickle into your ears, you never would have expected the tired, pale man that walked into the kitchen. He, like Kuro, was lanky and seemed uncomfortable in his own body. His two eyes were heavy and struggled to keep their lids up, while his third eye remained alert. All right, all right, Fukuro, good morning. He waved the boy off, who practically dragged him into the kitchen. He gave him a look. The boy gave him space. Coffee? Kudo's mother offered. Please. Kudo's father melted into his seat, his eyes softening as his wife poured him a cup of coffee. Kudo starts school today, his mother said. Third grade. 
Third grade, huh? He took a sip and set the mug down. You ready? Kudol fiddled with his fingers, rocking back and forth. I, um, uh, I don't know. His gaze lowered to the floor. If you don't know, then you're not ready. And if you're not ready, then you shouldn't go. Con, Kudol's mother began. I'm serious, his father said. A building full of people with nothing better to do than judge each other is better off not going. His father got up to wash his cup. Con, we've talked about this. Kudo's mother followed him to the counter, placing a gentle hand on his shoulder. He's been going for the past three years. We haven't seen any development of a quirk. He could be a late bloomer. At eight and a half? His mother reasoned. He'd be the very last person in the school to have a quirk at this point. His father huffed. That still doesn't change the fact that he isn't ready. He is ready! He just won't say it because he's afraid to talk to you. If you spoke with him more often, then- He doesn't need me to talk to him. If you talk to him, you'd see how well he's doing in school, Kudo's mother pleaded. Kindergarten, he played an owl in the school play. First grade, he joined the junior photography club. Last year, his pictures were featured in the fifth grade art gallery. Fifth grade, three years above his grade level. They've been on the fridge all winter. She stormed over to the refrigerator, grabbed the Polaroids from under their magnets and threw them at him. Kudo is fine. And who's telling you he's fine? And who's telling you he's not? Kudo's mother snapped before immediately faltering, registering the hurt on her husband's face. Con, I'm sorry, I didn't mean- Mom? Dad? The boy stood in the middle of the kitchen, twiddling his thumbs. If I'm not going to school, then... Is it still too late for me to show you my surprise? No. No, don't. Kudo. Your Kudo whispered as the boy timidly brushed his curtain of hair out of the way to reveal a scar in the center of his forehead. I'm just like Daddy now. So now he can talk to me, he said. Kudo. You found yourself saying his name at the same time as his mother, in the same tone as well. A beat passed, until Khan muttered, I thought you said he was fine. Khan, I didn't know he- You told me he was fine and I almost, almost believed you! And then you turn around and you lie to me! I wasn't lying, I really did it! <coughs> Kudo's mother was cut off by Kon's hand wrapping around her throat and lifting her in the air, the same way Kuro had done to Hawks. He was supposed to be like you! Kon shouted. Kuro's mother kicked and flailed, reaching up to grab her husband's hand, which only gripped tighter. <coughs> Her muffled pleas fell on deaf ears as he continued to wail. He was supposed to be normal! He was supposed to be nothing! The boy began to beg now, pleading in his mother's place. Daddy! Daddy, stop it! Please stop! Older Kudo joined in as well, matching the boy's pleas word for word. Please stop! Stop, stop, stop yelling, yelling at her! her. You're hurting her. her! This... Is your fault. You were supposed to fix it and you did it. This is your fault. His voice cracked and his arms began to shake until a sharp snap echoed through the kitchen. Mommy! Both Kudos screamed. You could have sworn you saw Kone's eyes flicker to the older Kudo. Their mother stopped flailing, and her hands grew limp. 
<laughs> Choked screams died down to low gurgles as blue liquid began to sputter from her mouth. Kon let her go, and she dropped to the floor. Kudo and the boy dropped to their hands and knees and began to crawl to their mother's body, their hands now covered in the liquid, slipping and sliding on the floor. The boy tried to wake his mother, nudging her and tugging on her dress, while Kuro placed his hands over her ears to muffle out his father's voice. This is your fault, Kon muttered. Your fault. This is your fault. This is your fault. Stop it. Your fault. This is... Kudo shut his eyes, clamping his hands harder around his mother's ears. Your fault. This is your fault. His father kept going, his mutters growing into a low chant. This is your fault. Stop it! Kudo yelled louder. The boy whimpered. Your fault. Your fault. Stop it! Your fault. Stop it! Your fault. Your I said that's enough! Kudo's voice rang out so loud, you felt the world shake. The house began to crumble and fold in on itself until... Snap! You felt your body fall to the ground and hit the concrete of the rooftop, back in reality once more. Kudo remained crouched on the ground, hands trembling over the space his mother once laid. Shima. Hawks took a few cautious steps towards him before leaning down and offering his hand. Shima. Hey. Don't you touch me! Kudo grabbed Hawk's hand and threw him across the rooftop. His body bounced and tumbled as he skidded along the concrete like a rag doll. How dare you think we're anything like each other! Stop trying to turn this around and make this about me! This was never about me! You're the murderer! You're the bad guy! <laughs> yeah. Hawk steadied himself and stood, spitting out a mouthful of blood. Well, that's not how the media's gonna portray you if you keep this up. You stood up and glanced over at the edge of the roof. Hawks was right. The crowd below was massive. Several other heroes, Deku, Ravity, and Icy Hot, joined the Blasty Boy and his friend in keeping the crowd at bay. News trucks were below, and the one helicopter you thought you saw had tripled and were hovering low enough that you could see the cameramen inside. And the windows of the studio across the street? You could see the Jumbotron's reflection of the aerial footage showing the three of you. You could feel your limbs tremble and shake. No. Now was not the time for jelly legs. Kudo's breath came out ragged and shallow. You were honestly surprised he was still standing. You're right, he said, taking a step forward. So we'll just have to show them who the real villain is. The veins on Kudo's forehead bulged even more, pulsing, threatening to burst. Hawk's body stiffened. With rigid hands, he reached behind him and grabbed a feather, the biggest one he had, and swung it into a fighting stance. Shima, Hawks muttered low enough for the microphones not to pick anything up. Shima, listen to me. You don't want to do this. Killing? Killing's the easy part, but living with it? Having that sit on your conscience for the rest of your life? The body? Those closest to them? Those closest to you? Nobody looks at you the same, no matter how right you think you are! You don't want this, Shima! You don't want this! SHUT UP! I 
told you to stop turning this on me! This is you! You did this! This is your fault! Your fault! Hawk's body turned to face you. His stance was strong and confident. He looked almost regal. The way his golden hair and crimson wings flew lightly in the wind. Like you'd seen on TV. But the one thing no camera could ever catch was the fear that shone in his eyes when he drew his feather in your direction. Kudo turned to face you as well, staring you down as he spoke. I told you if you opened that door, he'd kill you. And with that, Hawk sprinted towards you, swinging his feather wildly. You weaved and dodged, trying not to faceplant in the process. Duck! You felt a gust of wind blow over your head as you narrowly missed a blow to your neck. Out of your peripheral, you could see your own strands of hair falling to the ground. Hawks was definitely slower and sloppier under Kudo's control, but you still were barely able to keep up. Above you! And the time you spent recovering from the last attack, Hawks had flew up and was now darting towards you, coming in for a piercing blow. You reached out and grabbed his hands before he could land the hit. Your body trembled. No. It vibrated. As you held Hawks up by his arms. You felt the vibrations pulsate from the ground, through your feet, and into your arms, allowing you to lift him higher. Hawks' eyes widened. So did Kudos. And in his shock, Hawks was able to break the spell long enough to use his wings to pull away a bit, lessening the strain on you. Kudo was quick to regain focus. You saw Hawk's face tense up as he tried to fight the manipulation. Kudo, clearly fed up with this, turned around and called out, Do it! Do it now! You glanced to the side to try and catch who he was yelling to. That's when you saw Heavy dashing towards you. Shit, you'd forgotten about him. You raked your brain for a plan, but before you could throw something together, Heavy had placed his hands on Hawks and shoved him towards you. <sighs> you cried out as Hawks' density nearly quadrupled. So heavy, even his wings drooped. The momentum from the push, paired with the extra weight, sent you stumbling towards the edge. Despite your surge of strength, your knees buckled and your arms began to give out. It wasn't long until your arms fell, leaving Hawks hanging on to you, dangling from the edge. The crowd below cried. Drop me. He muttered, staring at the earth below. What? Maybe you didn't hear him right over the wind. You need to drop me, Ox said clearer now, looking you dead in the face. You can't hold me much longer, and you can't pull me up, and even if you could, Shiba would just try to get me to kill you again, and I don't... I don't want to hurt you. His voice cracked. Tears welled up in his eyes, flowing freely from his face and disappearing several stories below. You willed yourself to clutch tighter, hang on longer. Takami. I'm not letting you fall off this building by yourself. Takami's eyes softened. You haven't said my name since... You've told me to say it more often, right? You didn't realize you were crying until you saw the sparkling droplets fall over the ledge. You smiled. Until one by one, 
you felt your fingers begin to loosen their grip on Takami's hands. Why? Kudo muttered. Why do you keep going back to him? I don't understand! Kudo called out to you. You felt your stomach lurch. He's hurt you time and time again, and I'm giving you a chance to let him go, and yet you still hang on! How many times do I have to tell you? You're nothing to him! I'm not the bad guy here, I'm just... I'm just trying to protect you. Kudo's voice faltered. You tried to fight back against the manipulation. You used every ounce of strength to keep Takami in your clutches. But your body was beginning to give out, and Kudo was able to inch your hands further and further apart. Until... Takami fell. You couldn't hear yourself scream, nor the crowd below. You couldn't hear the whirring of the helicopters or the rush of the wind around you. All you could hear was the low whisper that came from Takami's lips as he mouthed the words, You're everything. No. No, this wasn't how this story ends. Kudo may have been right. Hawks was a lot of things. Cocky, stubborn, a downright idiot at times. But he didn't see you as nothing. He saw you as so much that he was willing to tarnish his own reputation. No. What? He was willing to die if it meant keeping you, keeping everyone safe! Kudo said it himself. This is your show, and the cameras hadn't stopped rolling yet, and you'd be damned if you'd let this man go without a fight! Your body pumped with adrenaline. You were shaking uncontrollably. You swung your legs over the ledge and jumped. Your eyes watered as you fell at record-breaking speeds. You told Takumi you weren't going to let him fall by himself, and you kept your word. You reached out with trembling fingers until you grabbed him by the arm and pulled him close. Instantly, you felt warmth. Visions of your time together flashed in your mind. You and Takumi posing for last summer's squeeze soda campaign. Takami spamming your messages with the pictures because he knew how flustered seeing the two of you in beachwear would make you. That damn quick and chicken Christmas campaign where you first met and got to know Takami. Even the spontaneous underground rendezvous he took you on. The ramen shop. The late night phone calls. You saw all of it. As the two of you plummeted, the trembling in your body quickened to a sharp vibration once more. This wasn't just a fuzzy feeling from touching Takami. This was heat. Real heat. So hot that it felt like your body was on fire. No, wait. Your body was on fire. White flames engulfed you. The ground was getting closer. People scrambled to move out of the way. You closed your eyes, bracing yourself for impact. You felt someone shove you. Your head felt lighter. Crash. A blinding light. And then... Darkness. You gonna go over these lines with me or not, partner? Howdy, partner! Pudo rested his eyebrows. Rested his eyebrows on the armrest? You know, let me just plant my face on this armrest. No big deal. And his hands in the lap of his eyes. Wait, what? What? 
That's not how anatomy works. Scooter, 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 <laughs> scoot, scoot. What? Ooh, ow, ow. <coughs> Daddy's home. When Hawks walks into the building. Above you, above you, above you. If you try really hard, it kind of sounds like he's saying I love you. Eh? Eh? We're reaching. Anything for the breadcrumbs in this bakery. Duck! Quack, quack. Body pumped with adrenaline. Adrenaline, 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 adrenaline. This is Space Freckle from the future to tell you what you're about to hear is Space Puppy trying to attack my CL Phantom Hive plushie and me yelling at her for it. Space Puppy, why are you making so much noise? Hey! But eyebrows behind the scene would raise. <laughs> eyebrows. <laughs> Hawks. <laughs> Sun Tai He reminds me of Chloe from Miraculous. Utterly ridiculous. All right, thank you. I need the events team cleaning out of the blah, blah blah blah. How in his pursuit to hold the world up, he had let you down. Eh eh eh. See what I did there? Eh. Wordplay. Hey hey. <coughs> Suspicious half-eaten vanilla pudding cup on the bedside table. Do y'all like chocolate or vanilla pudding better? I like vanilla. Personally, you didn't clear. You didn't clear. Clear. Have you ever read the book The Click? be kidding me. The girls go to Orlando, bad girls go to Miami. Where do ugly girls like you go? <laughs> hey, hawks! Ooh, that was weird. Hawk! Squawk! Squawk! <laughs> squawk! 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 Okay, but if you've ever worked on a set, you know that stage crew is actually like that. Fun fact, the high school I went to was the specialty center for performing arts. So it was basically like being in high school musical. I'm not joking. Like we had musical numbers at lunch. What? Freckle did theater in high school? I would have, I, I would have never imagined. Potato, 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 potato. Okay, 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 okay. Hear me out. Hawks is a bird. Hawks is a spy. Huh? 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 You know what this means, right? Hawks, the bird spy. The bird spy? The birds work for the bourgeoisie. This is what happens when you lock yourself in a closet for 12 hours on end. And that's 12 recording hours. I've probably been in here for the equivalent of at least 24 hours. You ever say something so many times that it starts to lose meaning? Whale, whale, whale. <laughs> Yeah, Deku, gravity, gravity. <laughs> it's just a pile of gravel. <laughs> Shit! My water! Gravity was able to slow you down a bit, but the force you made was hard enough to crumble the concrete. Crumble the concrete. Duty calls. <laughs> yeah. Duty. Look, I'm actually crying now. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> oh god! No, I'm crying. Ah! <laughs> uh, I. Why am I crying? Got too into it. Oh crap. Oh no. Epilogue. Your eyes fluttered open. You squinted at the bright light blaring through the window. Wait. Last you remembered, it was dark out. You were outside and... Ah! Your thoughts were interrupted by the sharp pain pulsating through your body upon trying to prop yourself up. You cursed under your breath and laid back down. Stiff mattress, thin sheets, plain white walls, suspicious half-eaten vanilla pudding cup on the bedside table. You were in the hospital. Flowers and cards and stuffed animals surrounded you, lining the windowsill and furniture. You inched over to pick up the card nearest to you, the one by the pudding cup. A crudely drawn loaf of bread was plastered on the cover with the words, Baguette well soon, printed below. You opened the card and read the scrawly handwriting. So I came back in town and see that you jumped off a building for number two? If you still need me to answer that question, yes, you're a complete idiot. 
in the best way possible. Don't break any more bones while you're in here, okay? P.S. Don't eat the pudding cups. I tried them, they taste like old people vomit. You snorted at Young Ji's card. You were making a mental note to call her whenever you figured out where your phone was when you heard a knock on the door. You felt your heart begin to race. Who was it? Young Ji? Sun Tai He? Takami? Kudo? Some random nurse coming in to take your vitals? It was neither. The door opened to reveal Endeavor towering in the entryway. Ugh. The doctor said you were likely to wake up sometime today. You weren't sure whether to feel comfort or distrust. On one hand, he was Endeavor, the newly recrowned number one hero. On the other hand, you knew he was working with Takami in his plan to kidnap Kuro without your knowing. And that didn't sit right with you. So you settled your mood on a general shock, while Endeavor attempted to settle into the chair closest to the door, only to jump up when a small teddy squeaked under his rear end. He, uh, awkwardly cleared his throat, before deciding to stiffly lean against the wall instead. <clears throat> I see you got your gifts, Endeavor stated, pointing to the one in your hand. She told me to tell you not to eat the pudding. You nodded. Yeah. Tastes like old people vomit. How does she- Don't ask. You shook your head. Endeavor grunted. Right. Um... You began. How long have I been out? About two weeks. Two weeks?! You jumped off a building and caught on fire. It's a miracle you're even alive. Oh. Oh, right. You tried to hold back the memories from that night. Not ready to see some parts. A lot of parts, quite yet. You know... You have quite the quirk there, mystery model. You furrowed your brows and shook your head. Quirk? No, no, I don't have a quirk. Endeavor cocked a brow. He didn't say anything. He only took out his phone. He fiddled with a device that was too small for his hands for a minute or two, cursing under his breath muttering something about Shoto telling him to press the blue icon and how the damn thing must be broken. Until finally, he jammed his finger on the screen one more time and cast the display onto the TV screen in front of you. He pressed play on the video. You watched as you and Takami free fell from the building. You watched as your body began to spark and glow until it caught fire like a comet leaving a trail behind you in the sky. Takumi's wings, while drooping, looked almost ethereal in the white glow. The two of you looked like some kind of angelic phoenix. You saw a pink blur shove you out of the way of the crowd and briefly slowing down your descent before you crashed into the center of the intersection, shooting off a beam of light towards the sky. So you mean to tell me the person who can pick up a pro hero with their bare hands despite practically looking like a toddler and jump off a building on fire, only experiencing minor damage does not have a quirk? No. Or, at least, I shouldn't have one. You thought? You were well. Well past the age any kind of quirk could have developed. You've heard about cases of extremely late bloomers like that new hero in the charts, Deku. But that wasn't you. You weren't a hero. People hardly even know my name, you muttered. Endeavor let out a soft, uh-huh, before he continued. Quirk or not, you've definitely got a new name. 
Do you know what these people are calling you? You shook your head. They're calling you Supernova. As soon as the word escaped his lips, you felt your hands begin to shake. You quickly set the card back on the bedside table and prayed he didn't notice the paper rustling. Why are you here? You didn't mean to sound rude. The thought was just eating you alive. Why was Endeavor of all people, here of all places, when he had so much to do as number one? You were just the crazy person who jumped off a building and caught on fire. I have a proposal for you, Endeavor said. He then turned and clicked the lock on the door before adding, It's about Shima. Your eyes narrowed. What about him? Your words came out more like a statement than a question, daring him to say more on the matter. Better yet, where is he? If I find out those men in suits got to him- Be grateful they did, Endeavor stated. Jafar and Heavyweight are the best man available for the situation. We tried to get him out of the country quietly. Out of the country? You snapped, hissing as you sat up. You shipped Kudo out of the country? His only family is here! What about his grandma? The grandmother can take care of herself. Believe me. Endeavor muttered that last bit under his breath before adding, and she agreed to send him. He won't be alone, and it's much better than the alternative. What are you talking about? Endeavor jammed his thumb on the screen once more. More curses. Something about having a word with Jay Mobile until another video played on the screen, shaky and recorded vertically. Whoever was behind the camera was in the middle of the crowd, holding their hand up to try and get the best angle. You saw glimpses of pro heroes and caught words like, Please keep a safe distance. And, Stay calm. What do you notice about this video? Someone clearly wanted a boost in their follower count on Twittergram? You inquired. Endeavor's eyes narrowed. You apologized. He muttered something about birds of a feather under his breath before sighing and continuing. What else do you notice? You glanced at the TV again, panning your eyes across the screen. And then... You caught it. There's no law enforcement. You looked back at Endeavor. Why wouldn't there be any law enforcement at an event as big as this? The Keitsatsu are responsible for arresting and apprehending villains defeated by the pro-heroes, Endeavor began. Some of us may or may not have made a few calls to make it a little more difficult for that to happen. I don't understand. You furrowed your brows. If you didn't want Kudo arrested, then why did you send those men in suits after him? Those men in suits are the Order of the Cataclysmic Crown. They're not pro-heroes. They're not villains, either. Their goal is to make sure the government isn't abusing the rights of their citizens in pursuit of growth. Shima's quirk is the result of two abilities with their own setbacks merging to create the perfect storm of power. Ox told you what he was able to do, and I'm certain you saw it firsthand. Endeavor shifted his gaze from the screen, turning his attention fully on you now. If law enforcement got a hold of Shima, they'd lock him up in Tartarus without question. But unlike his father, Shima's younger and stronger, and pulling him out of an emotional situation like that would make him incredibly easy to manipulate. They'd turn him into a weapon, a pawn to use at the government's disposal. I've seen it happen before. You jumped at the sudden crack that echoed through the room. Your eyes fell on the cell phone crushed in Endeavor's hands. He took a deep breath discarded the device, and continued. 
I can't disclose the headquarters location, but I can tell you that the OCC will help Shima with his quirk and keep him protected. Shima is safe with the OCC. You stared at your lap, gripping the covers and allowing the information to process. Your childhood friend was sent to an undisclosed location to avoid being detained and manipulated by the government for having such a powerful quirk. If the government did get their hands on him, what would they make him do? You couldn't help but think about Endeavor's statement. You glanced over at the disintegrated phone sitting on the TV stand. He'd seen it happen before. Your mind flickered to Takami and how he was so adamant about keeping a low profile that night, despite how much easier it would have been to swoop in and detain Kudo, tucking himself in the outskirts of the crowds and weaving through back alleyways, all to keep the media away as long as possible. You thought about what Kudo showed you. The bodies that hung from the rafters. You couldn't help but wonder if the reason Takami did those things was because he'd been subjected to the same fate. However, you were pulled out of your thoughts by Endeavor's voice. There's a favor I have to ask of you. What kind of favor? You eyed him suspiciously. We've got word of some suspicious activity happening on I Island. The annual I Expo is coming up in a few months and I want you and Hawks to attend. You blinked, staring stupidly at the man. Me and Hawks? Why me? Hawks' flight gives him an advantage. If he needs to get off the island quickly, he can. In addition... His status allows him to hide in plain sight. No civilian would question why a high-ranking hero would show up at an event that showcases technological advantages that could help him in his hero work. Okay, but why do you need me? You asked once more. No civilian would question Hawk's appearance at the expo. But eyebrows behind the scene would raise. <clears throat> However... Endeavor cleared his throat, shifting awkwardly before continuing. If you and Hawks were to attend the event as a... Uh, a... Uh, uh, he fumbled to find the right words before settling on... A... Uh, pair? Then it would put less attention on Hawks' intentions and more on the... Two of... You... Together... Endeavor finished lamely. His face was as red as his flames at this point. The two of you stared at each other, allowing the silence to slowly suffocate you. Endeavor coughed. <coughs> How is Tucket that uh, Hawks, anyway? You asked, suddenly embarrassed to use his name. He was discharged yesterday. He had a few minor burns from the flames, and it'll take a little bit for his feathers to grow back, but he's dealt with worse. Endeavor eyed you seriously now. Look. I don't know what you did out there with your quirk or not quirk, but you saved his life. Whatever that energy was that surrounded the two of you, that fire, it protected the both of you in the fall. Gravity was able to slow you down a bit, but the force you made was hard enough to crumble the concrete. The city had to repave the whole intersection. You felt your breath quicken at his words. Look, I'm not going to force you into anything you don't want to. But between you hosting the Billboard Awards... And that stunt you pulled? 
I'd highly reconsider your statement about people hardly knowing your name. You've got a lot of potential, and I don't say that lightly. You want to know more about Hawk's world? This is your chance. And with that, Endeavor turned to leave. I'll be in touch. He, uh, glanced awkwardly at his phone and collected the remnants from the TV stand, shoving them in his pocket. Uh, soon. He opened the door, calling over his shoulder. I'll see you around, Supernova. And closed it behind him. <laughs>